Welcome to this second video from the Taste of Day uh, in the MA in Data Journalism and the Postgraduate Certificate in Data Journalism at Birmingham City University. In the first video we talked about what data journalism is and the different sources of data, the different places you might find data, particularly those beyond spreadsheets, and we talked about the different types of stories you might tell in data as well. In this video, I'm going to move on to actually um, some of the practicalities of telling stories and thinking about story ideas. And it's important to, to talk about this first before you even get stuck into the data, because stories make a big difference to the sorts of work that we do with data, the amount of time it takes us, and also getting jobs in the industry. One of the most common complaints uh, that I hear from employers is when they're interviewing applicants for data journalism jobs, um, there may be people who have the technical skills, but they don't necessarily have editorial ideas and an understanding of uh, what you can do outside of the spreadsheet work. So I want to start with a really um, basic example of a newsroom situation, a data journalism situation. Some new figures come out on the usage of railway stations, um, how many passengers pass through each station in the UK every year. Um, what happens next? What do you do next? In this situation, time is really important. Uh, the figures are released publicly, everyone has access to them, and you're pretty confident that most other news organisations are going to do some sort of story. In that situation, the pressure is on to turn around a story quickly. It's not about doing something spectacular, it's not necessarily a particularly big story that, that you can justify spending a lot of time on. So it's important to have a, a good idea quickly, and to be able to execute that quickly and simply as well. So here's um, where that data would appear. This is the Office of Rail and Road and the statistics are published on their uh, web page under estimates of station usage. You can have a play around with that yourself if you want. Um, and along with that they issue a press release which includes this data visualization. So in this case the organisation itself has actually done some data journalism and some data visualisation and indeed many news outlets will simply take that uh, top 10 and they will reproduce it and they won't necessarily actually do any data journalism themselves. They'll rely on um, the, the story as it's being given to them from the station. They might get some extra quotes but fundamentally they're not doing any extra data journalism and indeed that's what happened that is very particularly is very common um, in in the decades before data journalism become became uh, popularized and this is I, I think a really important contribution that data journalism has made to the sector as journalists we're no longer taking um, the authority's word for it that this data is accurate or a fair representation of what's happening. Now in this case we might ask okay um, how is the data being collected, who has done that um, and what is their vested interest. In this case we might conclude that actually there's, there's no particular reason why these statistics might be unreliable um, and we might go ahead and start working with it. But as you can see, the, the, the story that the, um, the organisation have decided to lead with is the top 10. And indeed, that's what many news organisations would go with, who's top and who's bottom. So here is how the Evening Standard reported that uh, data. And the Evening Standard's audience is people in London. It's, it's a newspaper um, for people who live in London. You can't get it outside of London uh, particularly easily. So their audience is really important to their editorial choice about the story. So their story is about how London dominates the top 10. Um, that will not be the story for a newspaper outside of London or a broadcaster outside of London. So having a, a, a feeling for your audience and considering what's relevant to your audience is really important in the data journalism that you do. Also notice how this story uses verbs um, to add some action to this data. 
Um, so there's the, the headline goes with revealed as, as the kind of key uh, action in this story. Likewise, named would be another one. So this is one um, very simple way to make your story uh, more active, more interesting. It's, it's about the fact that this data has been released it's, it's been revealed, these have been named. That's the, the new thing in your story that you can focus on. Even if the statistics are for last year, which is quite common, you might get data that is, is about the, uh, the year ending six months ago. So the data isn't necessarily about now, but it is the most recent data and it has just been released. Another thing to point out here is that that first paragraph doesn't get bogged down with who released the figures. The fact that this came from a particular organisation is not the most newsworthy aspect of this station. So in the first paragraph, you would normally say new figures rather than, um, or a recent report, rather than specify who that's from. Later in the story, maybe in the next paragraph, you would name where it's from. The only time where the source becomes important is if it's exclusive, if it's been leaked to you, um, if it's something um, that, that kind of sells the uniqueness of the story. One negative thing about this uh, version, this treatment of the data, is there are no quotes. So it's worth thinking about who you could interview and indeed who they could have interviewed to flesh out their story. So, for example, what we don't get from this is whether being busy is a good or a bad thing. Um, you would probably want to hear from station managers about whether um, this amount of usage, this amount of passengers, is something that they are having to deal with in some way. They're having to make changes because change is newsworthy. Um, whether they're being criticised for it, whether they're spending money. Likewise, you might want to hear from passenger groups about whether they feel that stations are overcrowded or indeed if they're doing enough to cope with the volume of passengers. Here we have um, another story and um, this focuses on the top and the bottom. Um, and again we've got the focus on revealed, we're naming the top station but we're also naming the quieter station and this time we've got some quotes. Uh, campaigners and, in and industry groups said the report highlighted the impact of station facilities. Um, Actually, most of this story is taken from a BBC article and the quotes were actually from the BBC uh, version of the story. Um, now, all of this is using the inverted pyramid format, a very common format in journalism. You start with the new thing in your story. What is new? Not the background. The background comes later. Um, so where this happened, what happened, some quotes, that will then flesh out the story as you tell it. And this applies to data journalism news stories as well. Not obviously to other types of data journalism like features, but certainly in news this is what you should be looking at. Um, sometimes data, you might look at a different aspect. So this is exactly the same data. And in this case, we've decided to look at um, the biggest change in years. One of the things about this data is that Waterloo was top last year, it was top the year before, so that's not necessarily that new. It's not surprising um, who is the busiest. So we might look at other dimensions instead. And in this case, we're looking at which uh, station has seen the biggest change. And it turns out that it's a, a really tiny station that only had 12 passengers uh, last year. And the reason it uh, got a boost, so after making some phone calls or doing some searching around, um, you might find out why. And the why story is the story here. And the story is that a particular um, celebrity uh, announced that they were going to give away mince pies at this station around Christmas. And so that is a nice little colour feature um, rather than, you know, who's top of the top of the table or bottom of the table. This story is using the data as context. So in this case, we're not reacting to the data. The data has been out for a few months, but a politician has made a particular claim um, or, or 
asked for something to happen, saying that there's no demand for trains to stop at smaller stations on a particular line. And in this situation, we as data journalists are able to um, add some factual context to say, well, here are the numbers of how many people use those trains. Clearly, it's not no demand. And um, you can compare the total of those passengers to the large station um, that, that is the, uh, the one that she doesn't want to get rid of. So fact checking, someone making a topical statement and, and you seeing the data angle to, the, to that can be uh, a useful part of data journalism. And then there's feature ideas as well. You might decide to take the least used stations and do a little colour feature on what those stations are like. You might do a little tour of those stations, interview people who work there, take some pictures or video or audio and put together a, an interesting feature, something that you didn't think to look at before. And that's what this person has done. Unfortunately, it's not perhaps as uh, in-depth as you would like. So they haven't actually travelled to the stations and even the pictures are taken from, um, just taken from online. They're not particularly interesting stations. Even if you don't go to the stations, you can still get some interesting quotes by picking up the phone and speaking to people who work there or around there or indeed local railway enthusiasts. You um, could also um, um, look at other angles of this. You could look at, um, you could ask people for their photos of what these stations used to look like before. So some critical issues to flag up at this point. First of all, you know, with any sort of release data, um, some of these news organisations haven't looked at the data. Is that okay? Should we be questioning it more? Um, we need to think about who is the source of that data and why it matters. There is a lot of um, what I would call data journalism where um, uh, PR organisations use surveys to promote their client um, or other pseudo-scientific methods. So if that's the intention, if it's a small source, uh, a small sample rather, then you might think twice about writing a story about it. And always think about quotes. Who should you be chasing for quotes? Why um, do you need to speak to those? And, and actually that why question also applies to your story. You're looking for people who can answer the why questions that your data analysis work uh, raises. So, now I want to ask you to um, do some of this yourself. Um, there's a, I'm going to give you a link to some gender pay gap figures. The question is, um, those figures are released. Um, what do you do? What are the stories that you decide to tell? And that's the first question. What's the story that you tell if you've not got much time? The other question is, if you had more time, and you decide to write a story using those figures, um, what ideas could you come up with? So here is where you get that data. It's uh, the gender pay gap service. Uh, the address is gender-pay-gap.service.gov.uk. It's at the bottom there. But equally, if you Google that, you should uh, find this pretty quickly. And you'll see a link on that page which says download all gender pay gap data. If you click on that link, it will take you to a page with um, the uh, data from the last two years. So that will be, or in fact, it might be more when you're watching this video, but it will be about 10,000, over 10,000 employees, uh, sorry, employers, organizations. Um, and then there'll be the current year's data, which is which will change as new data is added to it. So um, you can choose any of those. Um, in terms of the uh, reacting to this data, it's probably best to use a full year's worth. Um, uh, if you're doing a, a more in-depth piece, you might want to look at uh, more recent or indeed all the data covering a number of years. But at this point, I would say pause this video, have a look at the data, download it, have a look at it, have a look at what's in the different columns and start to come up with ideas of what your quick turnaround stories might be and what your longer, more in-depth, 
far more original ideas might be, but might be a bit more tricky to find. Okay. Once you've done that then, I'll move on. Here is the data. This is what it looks like. It goes on for about 25 columns. Um, and there's all sorts of different data in here. We've got data about the employers. We've got uh, locations, we've got categories for sick codes, there those are category codes for different industries that those employers are in. We've got the difference between uh, male and female salaries as a mean and as a median. Now a mean average is if you add up all the uh, numbers and then divide by the number of numbers. And uh, mean averages can be skewed by very big values, also by very small values, but it's more common for them to be skewed by very big values. So someone earning a lot of money in this company would, would skew the average. If one person's earning £10 million a year, that's going to skew that average. The median, however, is where you line up all the numbers and then pick the middlemost number. In other words, the number, the point at which half of those numbers are lower and half are higher. So those are two different types of average, um, and you might use them both for different reasons. Um, the median is quite commonly used in news reporting, particularly to do with um, money, to avoid that skew. So because when people talk about averages, you generally assume they mean a midpoint, so median is often used. Um, a mean, however, is quite um, useful, particularly in terms of gender pay, because uh, gender and pay, because uh, means are skewed by higher wages at the top. If that's a man at the top, um, then that will skew the wage, and that's actually relevant in this particular story. As you go on in the data, you also have information about uh, the, the number of people in the top quarter of earners, who are male and female, um, who's reported the data, where they publish extra information, uh, when they submitted this data, and so on. And this is what it looks like on the website if you search for a particular organisation. So you get that information uh, published in text and in charts. So I'm going to show you some of the stories that have been done with this data because it's a very good example of how one data set can be told in different ways. And also, you will see if some of your ideas are similar to the ideas that journalists have had um, in the stories that they've told. So first of all, we've got the big figure. This is a striking statistic story. Um, how many of the firms have uh, a gender pay gap in favour of men? And the big figure, the striking statistic, is 78% of all the firms who reported had um, men earning more than women. Some will have had women earning more than men, and some will have had a complete, um, no, no difference at all, men and women earning the same amount on average. But also some stories have focused on particular sectors. So we've got a story here about um, academy schools uh, and we've got a story about government bodies. And in fact, the story about government bodies also has a time dimension. So in that story, we're looking at change. Um, has it got better or worse? In this case, what that story is essentially saying is the government bodies themselves are getting worse um, at paying men as, not, as much as women. Actually, men are getting paid more than women and more than they had before. These are personalization angles. So um, the, the top example uh, allows people to find their own company in the data. Well, you can do that on the official website anyway, but um, this gives a different angle in terms of when your company stops paying women. So if, um, if you spread the pay across the year, when do they stop? The example underneath that is about regional variations, and um, this is a story I was involved in. Um, there is a, a gender pay gap day, an equal pay day, sorry, which marks the point at which the average woman stops earning and the average man carries on until the end of the year. Um, so in other words, it's around five or six weeks before the end of the year, and the average man earns the equivalent of five or six weeks more pay. But that varies across the country. So what we decided to do was show how that varied. In some areas, your equal pay day in your area comes earlier in the year because the gender pay gap is greater. 
and in some areas of the country the gender pay gap day comes in the next year because women earn more than men and you can see those are yellow on the map um, and there's not very many of them. So it, again these are all different angles on the same day data. You might also think about format so we've got an explainer here um, we've got a video explainer as well which is, so we're thinking about medium here a different medium to tell the story in and there's a listicle there as well. And then finally there's the quality of the data. Um, this was a story um, that the data unit was also involved in where um, one of the reporters in the BBC noticed that some organisations were reporting gender pay gaps that were absolutely zero, both average, uh, median average and mean average um, and, and other kind of suspiciously um, very predictable figures, so 50-50 splits between men and women in all categories, that sort of thing. And at that point, um, we picked up the phone, we spoke to the organisations, many of whom admitted that they had or, or realised that they had submitted incorrect data. Um, we spoke to the organisation responsible for collecting the data and asked why they weren't checking this themselves. And we spoke to a charity which um, is campaigning for better reporting of these figures and that charity uh, criticised the government for not um, checking that data. So it's all about angles. It's you know thinking about not just the, the technical side of, of analysing the data but why you're analysing it, what questions you're trying to answer and what the story is that you're trying to find and will have to tell. So you can focus on individual data points. Who are the outliers? What's the, you might do a story about the company where women earn 99% more than men. I can tell you there's one of those in the data set. Um, you might focus on the average company. What are they like? Um, what's the average pay gap and who represents that? You might pick a topical angle like the academy schools. Academy schools are a very topic, topical issue in the UK. So that's why that news organisation decided to look at them. Equally you can look at categories or sectors or locations. Um, if you're working for a local news organisation you would look at the pay gap in your area. I've mentioned different formats. Um, you can report on reaction to the data. So uh, in, in the case of the bad data that was reaction to that or action being taken as a result of the bad data of the of the data. Um, campaigns around the data, I've mentioned concerns about the data, you could merge this data with other uh, information as well, so for example you could combine this data with data about the individual companies, who their directors are, whether they're male or female, is it the case that companies with uh, male directors tend to have bigger pay gaps than uh, female directors for example, to answer that you would have to merge with other data. And it, it, all of this might lead you to an interview and the interview might be the story and the data just becomes some background to that. So there are lots of different angles and it's worth thinking creatively about those rather than focusing too heavily on the data itself. Just to um, illustrate this, here's an example of a story which again has no quotes in it. It's about um, welfare and um, the changes to the welfare system, so it's a, a topical story, but there's lots and lots of numbers in this story and no people, no quotes. So we really do need quotes and humans to bring this to life. In particular, we need to answer the why questions which I've already mentioned. So ask yourself who is affected by the picture that the data paints. So in the case of the gender pay gap, Obviously women are particularly affected by the data, but it might be women in particular sectors, uh, it might be particular organisations. Try and think about who is impartial and an expert on this and can give the bigger picture. Also who knows how the data is being collected and what issues there might be with it. You might be misunderstanding certain dimensions, um, assumptions might be being made that that person can clarify. And who's responsible? So 
for example, at companies with large pay gaps, the owners of that company, the bosses of that company are responsible for that pay, that pay gap, if you like. If it's something to do with um, public services, then it would be the particular authority or ministry responsible for those services. If there's some sort of criticism or problem, you want to be asking them, why is this happening? Who is responsible? Um, and um, by the way, this is uh, the, the quality of the data issue. Just to illustrate that, this was a, a story recently about some, it's actually about a book about um, about happiness in marriage. And you can see a lot of news reports about this book and, and the author saying that being married actually makes women uh, unhappy. And a large part of that um, claim was based on a misunderstanding of the data. So in, the, in this particular data that was being looked at, there was a value that said spouse absent. The author of the book thought it meant that the spouse was not in the room when the question was asked. In fact, it meant that the spouse was not in the same household. So in other words, they had separated or they were living apart. Um, that completely changed and undermined the claim being made. So it's always worth making sure you understand uh, what the data means and you're not making assumptions about particular uh, categories or descriptions. So just to sum up um, some key points from this, first of all, often in journalism, it's about hitting a deadline. Um, yes, you can spend months and months working on a data set and do something beautiful, but if you can't hit a deadline, then it's going to be very difficult to get a job in journalism. So you need to do the quick turnaround stuff as well. So understand what stories you can turn around quickly and do that. Be good at being quick. That is a real skill in journalism. Get a quote early, get the story out. You can still do the deeper story. And in fact, you'll be better equipped to do that. But uh, make sure you can do the quick stuff as well. Also, when you're uh, doing those stories, think about the structure, think about verbs, what makes your data um, newsworthy, what makes it new. It's probably going to be the fact that it has been released or revealed or that things have been named. Answer the why question that the data raises. Um, data describes things most of the time. It rarely tells you why. So that's when you need to do the extra journalism to pick up the phone, to do the interviews, to do the background research, to find out why crime is going up, why certain companies have bigger pay gaps than others. Um, and that's where the journalism really adds something to public understanding of an issue, not just awareness of an issue. And finally, ideas are king here, not the data. Um, some of the best data journalism is not necessarily technically complex, but they are great ideas by journalists who are able to um, see problems in society, are able to think of creative ways to tell and find stories, um, who uh, report well. So read really widely, read a wide range of newspapers and magazines, watch and listen to broadcast news, read books, um, be really curious about the world around you. It will help you get lots more ideas because often our ideas are inspired by our, our reading and and also our, our awareness of what's possible. So different formats, the way that people have done data journalism on other stories or previously and Use that reading to come up with story pitches, ideas for stories. That's it from me. Um, thank you very much. I hope this video has been useful. If you want to know more, contact me at Birmingham City University. Um, you'll find my details on the website. My email address is paul.bradshaw at bcu.ac.uk. I'll say that again, paul.bradshaw at bcu.ac.uk. UK, um, or you can search for the MA in Data Journalism um, to find out more details.